Let's get some sound on there. That'll help. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm Dan, your friendly fishmonger from dancefish.com. And today I have an exciting live stream for you because not only are we going to do the normal Q&A and give you the shipping report and all that jazz, but we're also going to tell you what came in, show you the new fish that came in. And I've got a nice list of new fish. I'm pretty excited about some of these. Um, some of them I've never seen in person before. So some of these are brand new to me and I'm excited to share them with you. All right, so with that, I'm gonna get right into the shipping report, which is that there's nothing to report. Everything that we've shipped since last week has been fine as far as we know. So everything's in good shape. Um, if you did get something from me and it arrived in poor shape, please do reach out, dan at dancefish.com, and let me know. But as far as has been reported, everything's going just fine. So that's good news, cheers. Yeah, so <laughs> I start the live stream and I, I spend like a few seconds going, hello, hello, welcome, welcome, hello, hello, and welcome, welcome, hello. And that's because I'm never quite sure when the stream starts. So I don't want that awkward moment um, when you are just sitting there and watching me go like this, you know, for 30 seconds and then Oh, hey, everybody. You know, I don't want that. So it, it, it it's kind of like iffy when it's going to actually start. So that's why I do that. <laughs> so I know I know every now and then, like as soon as it tells me it's gone live, I stop. But I know every now and then I've watched a replay and it, it's been hello, hello, welcome, hello, welcome, you know, all that for, for like 15 seconds. <laughs> Just because you never know. It's, it's tricky, this live stream thing. <laughs> So whoever was giving me grief about that up there, that, that's why I do it. That's why I do it. Okay, so sent off more fish today. So I'll know tomorrow if there were any issues in the fish that were sent out today. But uh, I don't think so. Everything's going pretty darn well. I did have to put heat packs in two boxes because they were going to colder places that are in the low 60s. But uh, I expect this might be the last week of heat packs. Unless, I mean, I always check the weather. So there could be a cold spell. Um, or, or you could live, I don't know, in some freakishly cold little zone or something like that. But we're just about done with, with heat packs. Thank goodness. I, I really hate heat packs. <laughs> I mean, I'm grateful to them because they let me do what I do. But I hate the uncertainty of them. I hate the just, they're just a hassle, but you got to use them. Um, all right. So with that shipping report, which is it's all good, I'm going to tell you everything that not everything, but the highlights of what came in. And then after that, we will um, do the giveaway. So we're going to give away some red lizard catfish. But before we do that, let's get right into it. <laughs> right into it. He says, you know, several minutes into the stream. All right. First one that I'm excited about. This is a new fish to me. This is the Blackberry Silver Dollar. Um, so think of a silver dollar, but all dressed up and go and do a wedding or something. They have this neat orange hook on them and they, they really do look this good. Like you don't have to doll this fish up. It's just a good looking fish. So they have this neat red hook, this uh, blackberry section on them. And the thing that you're not seeing is they have a lot of sparkles on them that just aren't, let's see. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if the, yeah, this shows it a little bit. You can kind of see some of the sparkliness a little bit here, but the pictures don't catch it very well. So I think they're stunning. I'm really happy to get them in. First time ever with that species. And I'm going to close these out as I go just because it. I don't want this many windows open while my computer's trying to process a video. The next one, these are Geophagus altocina, the gold dust Geophagus. Um, this is another one that's new to me, and I think it's a cool looking cool looking fish. Nice gold color on it. Uh, mine are juveniles. They're probably a, oh, an inch and a half or something like that. But um, from what I've read, typical geophagus behavior, they're a sand sifter and uh, not super aggressive, like, like most geophagus, a good member of a community. But if you have a planted tank, they can uproot your plants because they're always sifting and digging, at least in sand. But besides that, you know, pretty, pretty awesome fish. We did get some more Shodeni puffers in, the uh, Congo spotted puffer. Uh, nice batch. Um, 
almost all, there's only one that I'm concerned about. All the rest of them are doing really well. There's one that just hasn't fattened back up yet. So I'm doing more deworming. I did another round of Levamisol today and you know I'll do that a little more since they're puffers. And so they need at least, I would say that they need another week before they're ready to go. So, so let me talk about this, I guess. So these fish I'm showing you, almost all of them are going to be listed for sale this Friday. And we've filmed a, a tour showing all the new fish in video form. And you'll know the fish are listed for sale because the video will come out. So as, as soon as they're all listed for sale, I'll post the video and make it live. That's kind of the signal for those that wonder when they're available. If the video's out, they're available. There might be a couple that are going to take a little longer to, to recover and be ready to sell. Um, and I'll try to remember and mention those as we go through these tonight, but I might miss one or two. But almost everything should be listed Friday morning of this week. These guys, it'll be the following week. I just want to give them a little extra attention. Although they came in good shape, it, it might be unnecessary, but it's, it's still something I'm going to do. All right, Rainbow Shiners, if you don't know this fish, they're amazing. Um, they're, it's kind of like having... A, I, I guess kind of like having a Danio in your tank, maybe not quite as active, but a very active fish um, and super colorful, especially when they're colored up to spawn. Rainbow Shiners are amazing. They can take cooler temperatures, so if you have a, a basement or a place that doesn't get too hot and you're like, ah, it's too cold for fish, no it isn't. <laughs> These guys would probably do great down there. A good, good for ponds and tubs and stuff like that too as long as you keep it well aerated and moving. Um, I think that since they're native fish, a lot of people toss them out in a, a pond um, that maybe a lot of fish would do well in, but they, they don't. They like moving water and they'll do okay in an outside pond, but they need high oxygen saturation in the water. So make sure you have it bubbling or something. It's not, it doesn't get too hot and isn't stagnant in water. Okay, these are new to me. Hylobagris flavus. So this is a shadow cat species. They stay small. I think maybe they get like uh, like an inch and a half, maybe two inches. I'd have to look again at it. It's uh, seriously fish to see the exact size they get. So, but they stay small. They remind me of the ghost catfish a little bit because because of their their kind of opaqueish body. You can kind of see through, but they're they're more of a bottom dwelling one. Um, Seem neat, my first time with them, so I don't know a whole lot about them yet, but uh, they're settling in, they're eating well, so I think they're going to be okay. We got in some Guayanacara or Bandit cichlids. These are like a Geophagus or a Threadfinacara, something in that vein as far as temperament goes and things like that. They, I've had them before, uh, different Guayanacara, and they don't seem to like sift the sand a lot or dig up plants or anything like that as much as maybe geophagus do. So I, I don't have a ton of experience with them, but I've kept them on sand and I never saw sifting behavior. So I think you might be okay with plants on these. Um, someone else, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but as far as I've seen, and they were labeled is, how do you say that, Oroefi? Um, so I think that's what they are, but I'm not, an expert at bandit cichlids and, and they all look the same to me so I'm not sure exactly what species they are but this is the species they were labeled as. Um, some mouth brooding severums. I really like these. I've had a couple in the past. They're big. They're beautiful. They get really neat like red red striping on them um, and the only uh, severum that's a mouth brooder so pretty neat little behavior there. Okay, Hemichromus exul, this is the, what do they call it, the Taracana jewel cichlid. So it's another species of jewel cichlid. The reason I'm intrigued by it is it's supposed to be the most peaceful of the jewel cichlids. As anyone that's kept jewel cichlids knows, they are a hyper-aggressive fish. It is hard to keep them with anything else. There's a lot <laughs> of aggression going on if you have jewel cichlids, especially when a pair pairs off. So. So that's a shame because they're, they're such a beautiful genus of fish, but they're so aggressive they can be hard to keep. 
This is supposed to be the most peaceful one though. Um, this is my first time with them, so I don't have a lot of experience with them. Um, these came in really rough shape. It took them about a week longer than the other fish to kind of settle in and start eating and things. So these are gonna need another week or two, I think, before I sell them. Um, they're starting to eat, they're, they're out and about now, and it's just gonna be a matter of time of fattening them up and making sure everything's okay for uh, a couple weeks before I let them go. But I, I think they're gonna be okay. All right, I couldn't find a good picture of this fish. Um, Corydoras septrionalis, the green, green, the northern green long-nosed cory, I think is the common name. Um, they, it's just, the pictures aren't quite right in my mind. This is okay, I guess. They have this green operculum, and they really are like a longer, slenderer cory than most of your cory species, with a longer face than most of them. So, another uh, flavor of Corydoras, another model, if you will, of Corydoras. Same peaceful behavior and grouping behavior and, and all that. Oops. Got some clown killifish in. I'm sure everyone knows what those are. But in case you didn't, these are clown killifish. Uh, you can tell them apart sex-wise because the males have this brightly colored tail and the females have a transparent tail. So that's how the easiest way, I think, to tell the, gen the, uh, the sexes apart. Nice group, no problems with them. I think they're doing great. Striped silver dollars, just a, a fancy, I guess, silver dollar. Um, I think they're, they're cool looking fish. So going to try them. Um, I've always liked even your standard silver dollars as far as their temperament and their interesting and things. Um, but they're a little bland. I mean, they're silver fish, right? So it's nice to see some of these other varieties of silver dollars coming out. Tiger striped or banded or striped, whatever, whatever you want to call them. Um, yeah, got some of them in and they're, they're small. They're about an inch, inch and a quarter and no problems. They're doing fantastic. Um, I did get some more Sultan Plecos in, so I just missed Bob Steenfot. He was looking for these a couple weeks ago. <laughs> I, I have some in now, but it's a little late. So, oh well, sorry, Bob. But um, they're small. They're, they're maybe around an inch, the batch I have. So they have a lot of growing to do, but they're doing well. Also, some mini Snowball Plecos. If you don't know these, these are like the Snowball Pleco, but the great thing about them is they top out at... Is it like two inches, 2.5 inches, something like that? So a lot of people want to keep plecos, but don't have tank space for a large species. These are a great option. They stay small. They're still as beautiful as like a standard snowball pleco. They're a nice hypensistra species, um, but they don't get too big. So I think a lot of people could keep them and give them a proper home um, instead of like you know, some of the larger species, like this one. This is a little larger. This guy gets 10, 12 inches, let's say, maybe a little bit bigger. So this is on the larger end of fish that I usually bring in, but I like them so much. This is the L14, the Goldie Pleco, or the Sunshine Pleco, and they really do look every bit as pretty as these pictures. I mean, you don't have to embellish them at all. They're just an absolutely stunning fish. And they're, the ones I have are, I don't know, inch and a quarter, something like that, inch and a half maybe. So I have quite a bit of growing to do. Got some more Gertrude in. I've got a standard Gertrude without location, but I also brought in some in of these. Um, I brought in the Aru 4. I'm not sure if this is Aru 4 or Aru 2, but they look pretty similar. They have these uh, nice bright yellow to orange tips on their fins which just add a little something extra to your standard Gertrude. And then the anal fin has this nice long hooked extension that comes out here. So this might be a picture of an Aru 2. Um, oh, this looks like an Aru 4. Yeah, this is a picture of some Aru 4s, I think. They look very similar to the Aru 2s. But nice, uh, nice location specific, pure lined Gertrude's. We did get some more stiff foot on Annie's in, and I'm happy to say that I got a nice group in. They were able to send me uh, quite a few this time. So I got about a dozen. They're doing great. They're fat. They're sassy. They aren't those skinny, emaciated gobies that you can sometimes see. Um, and they're this beautiful yellow and 
I'm sorry, yellow, like red and blue color. Um, really stunning fish. Really hard to get and really hard to get in numbers, but we have a nice group of them, so I'm excited. And those will be ready Friday. They're doing great. There's no reason to hold on to them. They've been strong from day one. Likewise, we've got another of my favorites of the Stiphodon gobies. This is Stiphodon rutilarius, and they do look like every bit as good as this. A, a dominant male will. A subdominant male or female. So you can kind of see, well, let's see here. Okay, so here. This is, I believe, a male, just not in dominant coloration. Whereas this is a male in dominant coloration with the, the brighter red. So really pretty fish. One of my favorites of all the stiffodons. A really neat killifish called Poro Panchax Rancorelli. It's a little lamp eye from West Africa. And um, yeah, I'm just excited to have some different killies in. They're hard to get. So whenever I find a new species of killie, I, I bring it in. And we have these. These are the Super Blue Emperor Carry Tetras that really do look super blue. Like this is not a lie. When they're adult color, they look like this nice, brilliant blue color. Um, so Emperor Carries are beautiful enough by themselves. You add this blue morph to them and they're, they're something else. Now, when they're young, they look more black than blue, but before long, they'll, they'll grow up and color out more and they'll be a nice, like, really bright blue color. Well, it's a, it's a darkish blue, but it's obviously blue. And it's very iridescent. Um, so, got some of those in. Um, a couple other fish I'm excited about. Moanotania. Okay, I've never had this rainbow fish in before. So this is Moanotania susii. First time getting them. Um, I, I think they're going to be pretty. They're still young, but there's there's two that are starting to get a little color even at that at that young age. And they're supposed to turn this nice bright kind of orange color with these black striping on them as they as they grow up. So I'm excited to get those and see them because I've just never had them before. And then Chilotherina pricei. This is one that I have never seen in person before either. So Excited to get these and see what they look like when they're big and full grown. This is, you know, there's a few pictures of them out there, but not a lot. So excited to see those. Now I did get a lot of other rainbow fish in as well. So if you're looking for rainbow fish, I did stock back up. I have uh, some Allen Iowa Pogas. I have some Blair Eyes. I have some Glossolepis um, Wanamensis and Multiscomata, the um, green dragon and red dragon, respectively. Um, got lots of got lots of the uh, the Melanotanias back in stock, um, and some other rainbows as well. But I won't go over all those because I've gone over those in previous streams. But that is where we're at as far as kind of the highlights of the import. Um, not that the other rainbows aren't a highlight; they're pretty awesome. But I've already got pictures of them and, and had them in the past. So I kind of wanted to hit the new rainbows. But if you have a question question about rainbows, feel free to ask it. If you're wondering if I got a certain species in or location. Um, yeah, I can I can talk about that. Mm. Well, I just like ranted about new fish for 22 minutes. So well, 20 minutes since I started a bit late. Okay, now with that, um, let's see here. We've got to do the giveaway. And this is kind of an exciting week for us here at Dan's Fish. So it's kind of this summer launch thing. Uh, you might have seen some posts put out by Chris on our Instagram and our Facebook page. Um, so we had the newsletter that went out yesterday. So if you're not subscribed to the newsletter um, and you want to be, send me an email, dan at dancefish.com, and we'll get you subscribed and send you the back issues. Um, and all that. 
Um, and it's we there's a nice article on on knife fish that was written in there. Michael Melier helped us with that and wrote a very nice article. So thank you, Michael, for that. Um, in addition to that, we have the Building Dance Fish episode three coming out this Sunday. And this will be the last one where I'm kind of more or less solo <laughs> because Jonathan is joining us um, this week. He's driving up, so he should be here. Well, it's a long drive. <laughs> it's like a two-day drive from Texas. So he should be here pretty soon. So that's happening. And then we have all the new fish that will be listed for sale um, this Friday morning. So did I miss something? Chris, if you're watching, if I miss something, let me know. But it's a, it's a pretty busy, crazy week for us here. So excited to kick summer off. All right. With that, let's get to the giveaway. This is for Red Lizard Catfish. Oh, for those that don't know that, I'm sure you do, but if you don't, these are really cool little um, Rhino Lacoria, uh, Pleco type fish. They get maybe about four inches or so, and they're a whip tail, so they have this long, you know, elongated body. Um, and there's been some debate whether or not they're a, a, a natural form of fish or if they're some kind of man made fish. No one seems to be able to agree on it. I thought that, oh, I'm not, I'm not sharing. Here, here you go. <laughs> this is the fish we're talking about that. Sorry, everybody. These, these whip tails, really cool little fish. Um, I thought that I'd come across an article at one point that it kind of definitively demonstrated that they were in fact a wild species or more for whatever, but um, but now I can't remember, so <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not definitive anymore, <laughs> at least not in my mind. So if you would like to win a red lizard catfish, then just enter into the chat, hashtag red lizard, that easy, R-E-D-L-I-Z-A-R-D, -E -R red lizard, and you'll be entered to win that catfish. <laughs> All right. Hey, we have 200 folks here. Thanks for being here, everybody. Cheers. If you don't mind taking a moment, sharing this out and liking it, uh, you know, getting all your ex-girlfriends and boyfriends in here, that would be awesome. Of course, I say that and it drops to 198, 197. The more I talk about it, the more it'll drop. It's just, that's the rule around you, I swear. As soon as I talk about, hey, look how many people are here. It's like, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> people jump ship immediately <laughs> it never fails all right so I'm gonna try to scroll up here and start getting to some questions and discussion and respond to you folks for anyone that's new if you would put hashtag not hashtag sorry um, put I'm trying to show one here there we go if you put the at symbol and dance fish and select it from the pop-up menu then it'll do this for me it'll turn bright orange in my screen and it makes it a lot easier for me to find your comment and respond to it so please do that um, thanks to my mods for being here Kayla's Aquatics and Reptiles and Maria Z and uh, anyone else that I've missed I don't know if Punchy Paints is here or I bet Candy Overhauls is still kind of moving in and settling down um, but any of the mods that are here, thanks for being here. I appreciate you guys ever so much. What is it? Just Kayla's Aquatics and Maria Z today? I'm scrolling here. That's all I see. All right. All right. Might have to. <laughs> might have to <laughs> change a couple things up so they get the help they need. But we'll we'll do that another time. Um, RB Animal Rescue is my jewel cichlid. Was always peaceful when I had some. Cool. I don't know what kind of jewel cichlid you had <laughs> or how you got a peaceful one, but that's awesome. In my experience, jewel cichlids have been hell on wheels. Globe Gaming. Hey, Dan, hope you're doing well. Doing so well. Exciting things are happening. Stuff's moving. It's a good time to be alive. What can I say? And it's finally warm here in Wyoming. So, you know, there's that. Of course, we could have a snowstorm next week. You never know, but... <laughs> Globe Gaming, are mountain minnows egg layers or lie bearers? Also, any tips for breeding them? So by mountain minnows, I assume you're talking about like the white cloud, white cloud mountain minnows. They're egg scatterers, one of the easiest to breed and raise. And um, 
basically for egg scatterers, you know, there's a lot of videos and information out there. So I would refer you to Mark's Aquatics. He's got some videos on how he breeds them. I think he's probably got white clouds specifically in a video. But even if he doesn't, the way he breeds neon tetras and zebra danios and all the other little egg scatterers is the same pretty much for white clouds. Also, Lumpy Dog on his YouTube channel has a video where he shows how he does it. He just has a well-planted community, uh, community tank, a, a well-planted aquarium with white clouds in it and some, I think he has gravel on the bottom. Maybe that's where the eggs get scattered and escape predation and uh, I forget what filter, maybe a sponge filter or something. Anyway, he shows that tank and he just has fry appear every now and then and grow up in there. So it depends. If you're trying to grow out a lot of them, then what you want to do is separate the sexes, feed them really well. When the females are plumped up and full of roe, then you take, if you have two males to one female, that's a good ratio. And you take them out and the way I would do it is put them in a small aquarium or even plastic like shoe box container. Um, I put them in there late afternoon or evening. Bare container, nothing in it except for a little bowl, like a little ceramic bowl, cereal bowl if you will, with a couple layers of marbles in it and some java moss in there. And usually the next morning or within a couple mornings, they usually want to spawn around sunrise, um, they'll go spawn in there. As soon as they've spawned, you remove the parents or you remove the bowl with eggs and um, you're off to the races. Now. It's kind of tricky with egg scatters. You're probably gonna have to try a couple times before you land with success. It takes a few, the, the eggs hatch pretty quickly, within a day or two usually, but they're not fully developed. They can't swim yet. They're basically a yolk sac with a little tail sticking out of it. So you just wait till they're free swimming and then you start feeding them. You can feed you know, little powdered foods and things, but the best is probably to um, culture like green water, infusoria, paramecium, rotifers, those kinds of little microorganisms for them. So uh, check out Mark's Aquatics. Um, he's got detailed videos on how he does all this. And the way he does it isn't like you would have to be an extreme professional to do it either. Any hobbyist with a spare tank can pretty much follow his method. So I'd recommend checking him out for a hobbyist that would like to breed. And I think you picked a good one. Um, white clouds are, are a good one to start with. Orange cones. My sister-in-law just walked to and listened for a few moments. She said, what language does Dan speak? <laughs> I said, fishies. <laughs> uh, was I talking about some scientific name or something like that? Yeah. <laughs> I... I I hope I don't use so much jargon that it's a turnoff for anyone new in the hobby. I wonder, huh, I guess I should think about that. The Fishy Mailman. I guess I should subscribe to the newsletter since I have a knife fish now. Thanks for the reply on the ABS cement. Haven't tested it out yet. Hey, you're welcome. Thanks for sponsoring the live stream last week and providing that $100 gift certificate to uh, celebrate Memorial Day. I appreciate it. Cheers to you. And yeah, I hope you're a... Uh, your aquarium build, your plumbing build, goes well. Fish guy, Mikey. I gotta go because moving night, but yeah, have a good one. Oh yeah, you too, and good luck. Moving's one of my least favorite things to do. I mean, I like the fresh start and all the possibility, but ooh, that whole transition phase, mm, not for me. <laughs> Six airbrush, great catfish. Well, thank you. I assume you're talking about the shadow cats or one of the plecos or the red lizards. That's probably the one you're talking about, huh? Or the corridors. <laughs> I don't know which one you're talking about, but I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> All right. I am uh, scrolling because chat jumpity jumped on me. Looks like uh, mods are having to delete and hide some messages. So just a quick public service announcement. Announcement: um, Make the mods' life easy, guys. Don't don't aggravate them. If you leave a question or comment for me, just leave it once. If I pass it up and I still haven't answered it, then feel free to ask it again. But don't don't spam the chat by repeatedly asking. And um, yeah, don't don't do anything to make the mods' life hard, basically. So please don't. They, they have full permission to ban anyone at any time. 
they're volunteers. They're doing this out of the goodness of their heart and I appreciate their efforts. So let's make it easy on them and make it an enjoyable experience for them. Cause they're, again, they're volunteering, right? So it's gotta be fun. Otherwise there's no reason for them to keep doing it. So mods, if anyone's giving you too much trouble, just feel free to ban them uh, at your discretion. I trust you guys. And uh, everyone don't do anything to get banned. <laughs> oh, behave. All right. Heather Body Smith, any tips on getting rid of black beard? Um, I personally like an electric razor. Um, I, 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 it's just easier. I'm lazy. I don't want to lather up with shaving cream and all that. No, I'm joking. I know you're talking about algae. Um, there's there's a few critters that in mass might might eat it down for you, um, but in general. Here's what I do with Blackbeard. I keep a scud culture in another tank, and anytime I get Blackbeard and it's choking my plants or whatever, I pick the plants up, I put them in the scud tank. I leave them in there for a few days. The scuds eat all the algae off them, get them all cleaned up, and I take them out and put them back in the tank. That's, that's what I do. Every now and then, if I have something that's absolutely out of control, I do a blackout. I, I just had an outbreak a couple weeks ago of blue-green algae, well, actually, I've had the outbreak for a long time, and I, I just couldn't resolve it. And so um, I took out as much as I could, and then I took a kind of thick quilt that no light's going to get through, and I wrapped it around the aquarium, and I left it there for several days. And once, if I have an algae problem that I really can't control, I, I black out the tank. And while I'm doing that, I, I don't feed or anything like that. Um, I don't, as all that algae's kind of dying off and creating... Uh, organic decay and ammonia and all those things that can happen with organic decay in an aquarium, I don't want to add to that that load, that shock to the system. So I just wrap it in a blanket, I leave it. I, I change a lot of water here, so I think that helps manage any dying algae and things like that. Um, but I, I just don't feed because I don't want extra waste produced during that time. And after a few days, um, check it and see how it's doing. But that's kind of how I manage it. I'm, I'm not a planted tank guy, so I don't have any like magic bullets or anything like that. Um, yeah. All right. <laughs> like Candy says, if you can type the hashtag, you can hit the like. Aw, oh, thanks. Not required, but it is appreciated. Yeah. Stephen P. Sorry, Stephen did that again. Stephen P. 2003, do you find that Shodeni puffers need to be treated for parasites multiple times throughout their lifespans? Um, I would have to ask my customers that. If you have got a Shodeni puffer from me, um, have you found it necessary to treat it as it's gone on? Or an Amazon puffer, anything like that? Or once you got them, were they pretty much good to go? It's a good question. I don't know the answer, Stephen. Um, I do know, as far as I, as far as I know, I think there's only been one customer that at least has reported to me that has lost one of the puffers that, that had a had a problem, um, and just gradually the fish wasted away, basically. If I remember the exact situation, so that might have been one where something developed. But I, I think this customer did treat for parasites and things throughout that process, trying to trying to help. Nothing helped. So besides that one outlier, I don't know of any other of the puffers that I've sold that has had an issue. But I'd be curious. So please let us know, folks, if, if you've had to do that so Stephen knows to be prepared or not, or anyone else. Alician AS. Any experience with woodcats? Yes, I have a great group of galaxy woodcats right now. They're fat, they're healthy, they're awesome. Um, I love them. I picked up a group of Tatia Musiaka today, the ninja woodcat. Yeah, cool one. I've never kept that specific one, but I think, I mean, I hate to be too general, but I think a woodcat's a woodcat's a woodcat, at least of the smaller species, right? I, I find them to be very active at feeding time. Uh, during the day, they typically hide, like most catfish do, um, at least wood cats. But 
once they settle in, they will come out every now and then, even in the daytime, especially when they're sparring and things like that. So sometimes you'll walk by the tank and there'll be a couple of them sparring and circling real fast. Um, it, there are some display things you'll see, but generally I see them when I feed. So I'll drop food in there and they're out and they're fast. They zip around real quick looking for food. They don't seem to bother anything. Like they seem to be good community fish. Um, and I think they're super neat. You see them enough that they're still fun, I guess. They come out at feeding time and they're so active and out and about that they're still fun. They aren't like certain catfish where you put them in the tank, you, you literally never see them again, even if you are feeding them, right? Not, not as fun. <laughs> Michael Mellier, my female Epistle McMasteri, by the way, hey Michael, thanks for all your help. Turned gray, ooh, and stopped eating a few days ago, still swimming and acting as usual, active as usual. What would you do? I don't have a quarantine tank ready to go, unfortunately. Hmm. Okay. So the, the first thing I would do is look for a stressor. Is there anything in the tank that you can see that's actively stressing her out? If there is, I would remove it and hope that as she recovers from the stress that she recovers uh, and her color turns normal and things like that too. So what could that be? That could be a fish that's picking on her. That could be, uh, so it could be a social thing, right? Fish is picking on her. She doesn't have a space. She doesn't feel uh, integrated into her environment. It could be if there's a male McMaster eye in there um, that they used to be a couple and now they're going through a divorce. <laughs> you know, it could be something went sour there and the male's picking on her now. It could be parameters. Um, I would definitely check for ammonia and nitrite. Uh, make sure the pH hasn't crashed. I don't know if your water's hard or soft. I would imagine it's hard where you're at, but um, make sure the parameters haven't shifted. Make sure the temperature's okay. Um, sometimes this time of year, kind of right around now and in the fall as well, municipalities will do big changes to their water systems and flush pipes and change water sources and things. So it might be good to see if something like that's going on. Usually if that's going on, several fish will react at once though. It won't just be one, but, but basically look for a stressor. Um, I would definitely clean out anything that gathers decaying organic matter in the tank. So if you have a sponge filter, I would clean it out. I would get rid of, um, anything that could foster things that would stress the fish. In this case, it could be decaying matter that creates toxins in the tank, like ammonia, or that creates protozoans and other um, microorganisms that can be stressing fish out. So I would do those things. If it's not planted and you've done all those things and it's not planted, um, you could do some salt in the tank. That just basically helps them conserve their energy and not have to work so hard to, to maintain homeostasis. Um, maintain their correct osmotic regulation. Um, hopefully removing stress helps. If not, and you want to medicate and you don't have a spare hospital tank, then maybe medicated foods? Oh, she stopped eating. Shoot. I mean, there are some medications you could try if the stress doesn't, if de-stressing doesn't work or if you can't identify any stressors. Um, Prozzi, Metro, and formalin-based ick medicines, basically, Quick Cure or Hikari ick usually don't crash your beneficial bacteria or anything like that. However, they can crash microorganisms. So they can kill off a lot of protozoans and things like that. So I've definitely had it where I've used anti-parasite medicines and the tank got really cloudy because it, there were enough protozoans and things like that in the tank, probably benign creatures, but enough of a buildup of that in the tank that when I use those medicines and they died off, I got cloudy water, which is even worse than <laughs> you know not doing anything at all because that's usually resulting from ammonia and things like that. So that, that's a little bit tricky one if you don't have a hospital tank. But 
if the tank's pretty clean and you've removed most of the decaying organic matter, which is going to be home base for most of those critters, and you've maybe vacuumed out the gravel and stuff like that. I'm not saying sterilize the tank or crash your cycle. I'm just saying get as much gunk out as you can. Then maybe uh, you could give some of those medications a try. Um, I don't know if I'd do antibiotics unless I had a hospital tank because that can be really hard on the cycle. Um, but yeah, those are my thoughts, man. Besides to say good luck, hopefully it's just a mood thing and her mood changes and she gets back to normal. Michael Machos, Dan, what are those orange and yellow fish behind you? Just kidding. Yeah, you and the rest of the world. <laughs> well, for those that don't know, these are gold roseline barbs, the Denison barb, Sahayadra Denisoni. They're awesome. I wish I could get more. I, I try every, every chance I get. Every time I can order them, I do. Often they're shorted. Um, there's not that many being produced and everybody wants them. So it's hard for the breeder to keep enough production going to meet demand. But I don't have any available right now. Next time I order, I'll try again and we'll see if we get lucky or not. Gold Nugget Pleco Tetra. Thank you for your live streams and giveaways. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you for your participation, for being here every week and taking, yeah, making this a cool place to hang out. Like if no one come, <laughs> if no one came and hung out, <laughs> this would be a different thing, right? In fact, the very first live stream I did, I had that situation. No one showed up. I was monologuing to the camera for I think an hour and a half, and um, the stream ended. And I was like, man, not one person. I I hadn't streamed before though, so I was like, well, yeah, maybe it takes a few streams for people to realize and uh, all that. It wasn't until a little later that I realized, oh. I thought I was live the whole time, but I wasn't. I, I hadn't set it up right or something. So <laughs> the very first live stream I did, I had the experience of just live streaming and no one showing up. Um, <laughs> in the first few, I mean, for a long time, there, there were not many of us. <laughs> so I'm glad that we've reached, what are we at, 212 now? Like that's a comfortable number. There's enough chat going on and enough questions and comments and back and forth to but it's not all on me all the time, right? So I'm glad you're here, Golden Nugget Pleco Tetra. Hey, Punchy Paints, good to see you, lady. Hope you're doing well. Roundhouse Aquatics, the jewels go with Manganos you had. Real nice, yes. Yes, Mangano, another very aggressive cichlid. Yeah, I've never purposely had Manganos, but every now and then I'll order something and they'll send me Manganos and it's like, oh, thanks. Jeez, it's like it's like bumblebee cichlids. Man, I never want them, but every now and then it's like <laughs> we got to get rid of these. Dan ordered this thing; we don't have it. Here's how we're gonna get rid of them. Here you go. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Skipper's Aquarium's Good to see you. Lunatic Fringe. I am wondering: Are you familiar with Juan Miguel? Yes, Artigas Azas. Yes, yeah, he's a big cichlid guy. Writes all kinds of articles does all kinds of um, really cool research on cichlids. He's part of the ACA, American Cichlid Association. He's from Mexico and has interest in live bears too. Oh, I didn't know that. I know him as a cichlid guy. There are more herichthys. Yes, yes, absolutely. There are quite a few herichthys. Um, in fact, I have access to three or four species of herichthys. Um, no, I don't. I'm sorry, I confused Teclid, Texas cichlids. That's, so this is Herichthys. In my mind, I was thinking of Thurichthys, right? Which is the Firemouth family. So I, I don't have that many uh, Herichthys species available. Sorry, <laughs> I was excited to show you the Thurichthys species I had available. Sorry, my mind uh, switched things up there. Scrambled eggs for brains. Globe Gaming, thanks. Do you think my Nerite snails will eat the white cloud eggs? I don't know. I mean, if they're hidden well enough that the white clouds aren't going to find them and eat them, then they might be hidden well enough that the nerites won't find them and eat them. They'll probably fall down in the gravel, and uh, I don't think the snails will get down there and get them. I don't know. Never, never tried it with nerite snails, to tell you the truth. Speaking of eggs falling down in the gravel, um, it's important that the gravel be clean. If it's choked with mulm, then the eggs will have a hard time surviving. Uh, water won't flow through very well, so you'll get stagnant areas that are kind of anoxic. There's 
no oxygen there for the eggs and they need a lot of oxygen when they're developing uh, or they can just get covered in mulm and gunk and kind of get smothered so I would, I would vacuum the gravel before you try to spawn them <laughs> Punching pains, I will change my name to not candy so you can see me easier. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I missed you before. It's just in that section I was looking at. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> you weren't there, <laughs> but hey, not candy. <laughs> Green Grove Aquatics, I've been away for a while. What are the orange and yellow fish behind you? I think I answered that earlier. Mountaintop Puffer Keeper. So I'm picturing someone like in Denver, Colorado, with a, a garage full of all the different puffers. The African butterfly fish, well settled into a planted 50 gallon, eat everything. Yeah, they're awesome. Looking forward to trying for fry over the next year or two. Yeah, they, um, oh, in fact, that reminds me, I better do that real quick. Let's do a quick demo here, I guess. Um, I think I've sold out of African butterfly cichlids, and so I need to change that. Oh, I did. Okay, good. <laughs> I thought they were still listed for sale. Anyway, I was going to do a quick demo and show you how to change uh, inventory on Get Gills, but we didn't need to. Yeah, they're, they're amazing. They're beautiful. They're peaceful. They don't get too big and they're easy to spawn. They're hardy. I'm glad they're doing well for you and good luck. I, I don't think you're going to have to try too hard to breed them. They, they're going to, they'll take care of business. They're, yeah. Just keep them fat and healthy and happy and you'll have, you'll have babies. All right. I am scrolling. Oh man. Chat jumped so far that I think it cut some people off. The next one I can see, so like I can go up that far and no more, is orange cones here. So if you left a comment or question above orange cones saying, yes, you were speaking scientific names. She's not a fish person, but we are, so no problems. Um, if you left a question or comment before that and I haven't gotten to it, please feel free to list it again because it got cut off and I can no longer see it. And I don't like doing that to people. Swamp Thing threw down $2, the jargon jar. <laughs> I like it. A dollar every time you use jargon. <laughs> it's like the swear jars they do for charity. <laughs> so, um, while I was educating myself about business and just getting a feel for things and getting into that world, I watched a lot of This Week in Startups, which is uh, hosted by a guy named Jason Calacanis. And back in the day when I started watching him, he swore a ton and his guests would swear a ton. And then one day, I think his wife got on him about it and so he decided he wasn't going to swear anymore. So they got out the swear jar and every time they swore, I think it's a hundred bucks or a thousand bucks or something, they go in that jar and then it all goes to charity. So I, that was kind of fun watching him try to change his habit. <laughs> Sometimes he'd get so worked up that he would just let it rip and he'd just be throwing money in the swear jar while he's going. But he was so mad he didn't care. <laughs> anyway, the jargon jar. I like it. Thanks, Swamp Thing. I appreciate the super chat. Always appreciated. Never required, but it does make my wife super happy when money falls out of the computer screen. Josh Kissick, have you ever kept rainbow wolf fish? No, I haven't. But if I did keep a wolf fish, that's the one I would keep. I, I do, I've seen them. I have friends that have kept them. I've never kept them. Michael Melier, do you sell live food cultures? I don't, but um, let me know what you're looking for, Michael. Send me an email. And if I can, I will take care of you. I mean, every now and then I do. Like every now and then I'll sell a scud culture. I used to sell fruit fly cultures. The issue is, is we grew... Um, I've had such a demand for my own live foods from my own fish, just taking care of my own fish, that it's been hard to produce enough to also have some for sale. I mean, if I really focused on it, I could produce a lot of live food, but it's, it's not, it's kind of not the crux of what we're doing. So, you know, I, I'll get like half beaks in or, um, you know puffers in and a lot of these these fish come in in certain species 
Oh, the African leaf fish is a good example. A lot of species just have to have live food to start. Like they come in, they're stressed, I need to fatten them up right away. And so I can't take the time at the beginning to transition them to prepared foods. I, I get live food in them right away. I get them fat and sassy. And then once they're kind of settled in and have recovered a bit, then I'll start transitioning them away from live food. So that's why I, I can't jeopardize my live food cultures because that would seriously jeopardize um, the health of my fish when I do an import. Now that's not every species. There's a lot of species that'll eat prepared foods right away, but there's, there's a lot that don't and you don't want to add stress to them right at that kind of delicate time. I am super excited to say that the African leaf fish are now eating frozen foods. They love frozen bloodworms. Um, they're an awesome fish. So I think a lot of people don't keep them because they can't provide constant live food for them. And if you read on online, it, you know, they're dedicated carnivores. So they basically have to have living, wiggling, moving food to trigger their feeding response. So I think a lot of people don't keep them because of that. They don't have access to live foods or they're just not comfortable feeding live foods. But this particular batch of uh, African leaf fish is eating well on frozen foods now. So if, if you like that kind of fish and you just haven't kept them because of the live food situation, this would be a good batch to, to try. Now they'll get out competed by other fish. Uh, they're slow eaters. They cruise very slowly and go, then they find the next blood worm and go slowly, you know. Um, so they're not fast, but I'm keeping them with Brocus, basically a large Corydora catfish. And that's a match made in heaven because um, the, the catfish aren't super fast to food. And that way anything that the leaf fish miss the catfish, you know, clean up. So I don't have anything they miss laying around rotting. So it works out really well. Cancer train. Some people really don't like scientific names. As a business, I wonder what the right balance of common versus scientific names would be. So generally, if a fish has a common name that's in common use, <laughs> I generally use it. The problem is, I don't, I keep a lot of fish that aren't your run of the mill stuff that you would find in, in the industry or in your pet store commonly or anything like that. And those don't have really dedicated common names that you could use reliably as an identifier. So the killifish, for example, very few killifish have a common name which is actually specific to that species. Very few rainbow fish. How many rainbow fish do I have right now? I, I don't know. I might have, I really don't know. I might have 40 species of rainbow fish right now. I, I can't use common names for that. That would be mass confusion. So, but things like white clouds, sure, I'll use the common name. Or um, blackberry silver dollars or striped silver dollars, sure, I can use those common names because they actually serve to identify. It's not confusing when you say white cloud. <laughs> you know, people know what you're talking about. But if I said, just made up some name for a rainbow fish, it wouldn't work. So I use common names when I can, when I think they're meaningful and actually identify a species. When I don't, then I tend to use the scientific names. Now there's a little gray area there where out of habit I might just spit out a scientific name because I was just reading up on that fish or something. But in general, that's what I try to do. I'm not trying to confuse people. I don't know Latin, and I'm sure I butcher all the names, but I'm just trying to be clear, honestly. That's that's the goal. Paul Soltero, hey Dan, have you ever considered putting good yids on your list? They'd be right up your alley as us unusual cool water libraries. Oh yeah, I love good yids. Um, I don't think they'd be super happy in my current water because it's pretty darn soft. And good yids tend to come from you know, kind of harder water from what I understand. Also, in the summer, the water here can get to the upper 70s, sometimes the low 80s, which is just too hot. A lot of them want to be like at 65, 68 degrees. Now, there are some species I could keep successfully, but the majority of the goodyids are not going to do great in my water, which is why I haven't brought them in. Now, in the warehouse, 
<laughs> Every problem is going to be solved by the warehouse. I know. In the warehouse, I will have access to some harder water, so that solves that problem. But I'm going to run that system at probably 77 degrees, something like that. Um, and that's still too hot for a lot of the good yids, if they really want to thrive. So that's the limiting factor. Right now is softness of the water with temperature, and in the warehouse it'll be temperature. So I have thought about that. I'm like, well, you know, once we add phase two, I could do a section there that's kept at like 86 degrees for um, discus and rams and stuff like that, and I could do a section there that mixes cold water back in and is kept around, I don't know, 72 degrees, 70 degrees, something like that for some of the cooler water species. But well, that's just a, a thought right now. I don't know if that's practical. I don't know if the engineering of that with the amount of water we're moving um, and how we have to treat all the water and stuff if that will cause issues. If it, if it will, then that'll be something that won't happen in phase two. We'd have to wait for a, another phase to do something like that. But it is in the back of my mind. <clears throat> There's just a lot of fish I wish I could keep right now, and I guess I could, but I don't feel like conditions are optimal for them, and I just don't want to do that to them. There's plenty of fish that love my water, so I tend to stick to those. <clears throat> New Mexico Aquatics. Hey, little Bobby. Every Wednesday morning, my wife asks me, are you watching Dance Fish tonight? And every time I respond with yes, if it's okay with you. So far, she always says yes. Well, have her join you. Fun date night, right? <laughs> what could be more romantic than watching my bald head talk for an hour and a half in Latin terms using jargon about fish? <laughs> hmm. Oh, wait. I did not know this. W. Marion says to Michael, my Episto ladies go gray white after laying eggs, but I haven't had them stop eating. Try spirulina pellets, something veggie, or baby brine shrimp to help with digestion. I've never seen that in female Episto's after they lay eggs. That's interesting. Well, Michael, hopefully that's it. Mine, mine turn yellow, generally yellow and black. But if there's some that turn white, hopefully that would be nice if that's the problem, right? Because that wouldn't be a problem. Six Airbrush, where do I get my scuds from? Dan, thanks. Um, I got my original colony from just a random dude on eBay. I would say Jesse would love to get rid of some scuds for you, but Jesse moved recently and I don't think has a lot more scuds. So anyone here, if you have some scuds, you could sell to Six Airbrush. Would you just put it in the comments and see if we can hook six airbrush up that would be awesome <clears throat> all right swamp thing i discovered that i have lucania goodyear in the drainage pond across the street my new mission is to catch them all then breed them of course pretty little fish i think i have one um i <clears throat> what was it oh ghost shrimp i ordered a bunch of ghost shrimp from Florida because I didn't have enough scuds and I had to feed those African leaf fish and I wanted to make sure that you know I was getting those knife fish from Africa I hadn't kept them before um, some of the mamirids and the rope fish and stuff I just wanted to make sure I had a nice supply of live food on hand so that I didn't get the fish and then like <laughs> be like shoot I can't feed them what am I gonna do right and, and in that ghost shrimp uh, bag I got some Lucania that came in as well. So I have one female Lucania right now. I don't know if it's Goodyear or Parva. So I, I don't know which species it is, but I've got one. It's living with the rope fish. It's loving life. It's grown a ton. It's fat and happy. But uh, those Lucania Goodyear are absolutely beautiful, beautiful little killifish. So do it. <laughs> C. Simpson, 1982. Do you plan on getting any Tanganyikan cichlids, specifically Cyprochromus? I have thought about it. I love Tanganyikan cichlids. In fact, I prefer them over Malawi, probably. I know Malawi is more colorful, but I like the specialized behaviors in just how niche intensive Tanganyika got. In Malawi, it's kind of like they generalize. And you got Mabuna, basically the 
each fish is basically the same, right? Different colors, a little elongated here, different things here. You got your peacocks and your haps, and yeah, there's some real specialization, but Tanganyika is where really I feel like you got your shell dwellers, you have your Brichardi types, you have your Lamprologus types and your Neolamprologus types, you have your sardine cichlids, your Cyprochromus and your uh, Paracyprochromus. I, I don't know what happened in Tanganyika, but I love the radiation that happened there. Um, so yes, I, it's a possibility. Here's the issue with selling Rift Flake cichlids, and like you know, a lot of a lot of the species of cichlids is aggression, size for some. Some of them get really big, and then aggression. So, the thing that <clears throat> I need to avoid right from the start. Excuse me, my voice is a little rough. <clears throat> the thing I need to avoid is having customers fail because they didn't know something. Right, so I I don't know if right off the top I'll sell anything from Malawi or Tanganyika or whatever, because unless you know about those species and their aggression levels and their specific needs, you can have real problems. I mean, even a cute little Neolamprologus multifasciatus. Um, sorry, there's no real common name. It's a shell dweller, but there's lots of species of shell dwellers. But even pick a little cute little shell dweller, right? Those things can be super aggressive and it could kill an entire you think hey i've got this big angel fish it'll be fine right if you're a newbie and then you get these shell dwellers and your angel fish are dead they just get got killed by these tiny little fish right so <clears throat> what i'm trying to do in general is keep fish that are easy to keep and people could buy and aren't likely to make a mistake and have like those aggression issues or that you can have with those rift like cichlids um, I, I don't know, we're going to be lean, really lean, like uh, uh, no, there's no fat to trim on us as far as the company goes for the startup. We have to be really lean and smart. Every penny we get has to serve the company. It can't be um, to start, right? We, we've got to be able to grow and develop and hire the help we need so we can get to the point where maybe we can write up detailed product descriptions and educate people a lot about each fish. But right now I don't have the, the bandwidth. I, I don't have any any extra time or any extra employees to do a write-up on a cichlid and say, hey, this is a very aggressive fish. Here's how you manage the aggression. Here's a specific niche this fish needs in a tank and all that stuff that, that you would have to do to sell cichlids responsibly. Um, so. Once we grow enough that we have enough people that someone could do those write-ups and things, then it might make sense. But I don't think we have the, the manpower right now. It's almost everything has to just be like pretty much foolproof. Now I know I've got knife fish and mamirids and, and a few things like that. But um, that's a one-off, one here and there. Most of the stuff is peaceful, community-oriented stuff. All things fish. Red lizards. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity. Hey, right back at you. Hope you're doing well. Always a pleasure. Wishing you the best on your endeavors. Best luck from South Dakota. Hashtag breeding is pleasure. You know it. Three times equals world peace and golazo. There's a little one. <laughs> Thanks. Good to see you, man. Hope you're doing well. The fishy mailman. I have a Shodene that I didn't get from you. I treated with general cure twice in Levamisol. However, it spelled. <laughs> Had no issues in two years. All right. So fishy mailman did like... A treatments right up front took care of that and then hasn't had issues so that's awesome good I'm glad you had success let's see is anyone else chimed in on that not seeing it Paul Soltero the male may be bullying her female pistols will turn down their colors when that happens yes that could definitely be what's causing the stress yes indeed Hey, there's H HC Aqua. Feels, uh, let's see here. Oh, okay. I wasn't, I, I was just excited to see you, man. I hope the move went well and you're settled in and doing all that. Hope it's going well. Mountaintop Puffer Keeper. Those African butterfly fish are doing excellent up here at 9,100, 9,100 feet. Woo! <laughs> I'm glad they're doing well. 50-gallon planted tank for the group. Have you ever bred them? 
Uh, not that I know of. I mean, they might have scattered eggs or something, but I've never bred and raised them. Um, in fact, if I remember right, I think there was a breeding report on them, but it's few and far between. I don't think most people are successful breeding them. But it's not impossible because, it, again, I'm just going off memory here, but I think there were one or two breeding reports. So I think it can happen. All right, wet my whistle here. Woo, hang on. <clears throat> you ever do that where you think you swallowed all the way, but you, you didn't? <coughs> and then you take in a sharp breath and it's like, oh, whoops. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> it's like a micro choke. All right, refill my glass here. There we go. Green Grove Aquatics, heavily planted 75 gallon with hard water, guppies, quarries, a koi betta, I think you're saying, and autosynclus for stock. Plants are fast growers besides the Anubias. Yep. Am I crazy to try to put Denisoni in? Okay. Well, do you have a plan B? Like, do you have another tank that if it went south, you could move things to? Um... Because this is a situation where it's like, it maybe could work, maybe. When the tank's big enough, I don't know how heavily you're stocked on those other fish, but I'm imagining it could handle, it's a 75 gallon tank. You can put quite a few fish in a 75 gallon tank. Couple things, I've never tried Otto's with Roseline Barbs. Oh, you said Demasoni? Oh yeah, you're crazy. I'm sorry, I read that Denisoni in my head. Y yeah, don't put Demasoni in. I, I, I would imagine we're talking about the Demasoni cichlid, the little Mabuna. Those guys are small and beautiful, but you have to be careful even putting them in with bigger Mabuna because they're vicious little suckers for their size. So if you're talking about the Demasoni cichlid, the little Mabuna cichlid from Lake Malawi? Absolutely not. I thought you were talking about Denisoni. Um, and the, the big question mark I had there was, can an adult Denisoni, I'm looking at them, I'm trying to see how big their mouths are, eat a full-grown auto sinkless? I don't know the answer to that. That could be a problem. And then if your guppies have long tails, I wouldn't put them in with um, Denisoni, just because Denisoni are curious and they go and they rub up and nibble stuff. Not, not like not viciously, but they're just a curious fish that can bug slower swimming fish like your bettas and your guppies and stuff. So I think Denisoni like maybe could work if I would not have a plan B, but Demasoni, oh no, 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 no. Orange cones, are you going to put your hair in a ponytail? Absolutely. But it has to be my back hair because my head hair is not long enough. Referring to your Bogo stemistilatus. Oh yeah, this stuff. I need to take the weed whacker to that. I don't know if it'll happen though. Like, there's so much to do to, to like grow the business that some plants growing out of control is a low priority right now. Rachel Irwin, I've been losing mollies lately. I thought it was a parasite issue, but the meds have not helped. It's affecting one fish at a time and only the males. Huh. You think it could be social stress? I mean, it could be. I don't know, Rachel. Um, so this happens to me sometimes too, where I'll have a batch of fish and I'll lose one and I'll think everything's fine and then I'll lose another one and I'll think everything's fine and I'll lose another one. It's just this gradual thing. Often I never figure out what it is when that happens. Sometimes I do, <clears throat> but I don't, you know, without a veterinarian to actually do a diagnosis, I wouldn't know what to tell you. You've already tried some medicines. It's still not helping. I mean, if if you're noticing that all the males gang up on one male and that male dies, and so they turn to the next one in line and they all gang up on the next, weak, uh, I don't know, least dominant male and that one dies, if you notice that, then maybe that's what's going on. I'd be a little surprised though I'm not sure. I wish I could help you. That's 
I do not know. Those situations are tough, and I don't know how to... Like, I'm usually at a loss even with my own fish when I get in that situation. I cannot wait till the company is grown enough that we can bring in someone whose job it is to literally, like, do skin scrapes and gill clippings and uh, work up the fish medically so we can actually diagnose things and treat smartly. Oh, I can't wait. Mike Stambaugh, just found out from local fish collectors we have killifish in our streams here in Ohio. Yeah, you do. You have one of my favorite. Yes, the northern studfish, pretty cool fish. Yes, one of my absolute favorites. For those that don't know this fish, this is Fundulus catenatus, the northern studfish, northern studfish. One of my favorites. I've kept them, I've bred them, I've raised them, I love them. They remind me of an Aphiosimian... Um, striate them a little bit because they've got all these red these rows of red dots on them the operculum is absolutely stunning it's big it's this bright reflective thing and it's covered with these red spots and they get a nice yellow let's see if we can find it uh, kind of oops i didn't mean to um here you go you get a nice yellow band on the margin of the tail which is really stunning uh, when they're feeling really good look okay these are these are better pictures yeah i mean these are amazing fish they get like i've had them six inches easy i've i've read they can get up to nine inches i don't know if i've seen them in that big but that's like almost eaten size they're not hard to spawn at all the eggs are big they're like little trout eggs or salmon eggs or something. Pretty good size. And they're really tough. They're hardy eggs. So they hatch well and they're easy to raise. Um, they need good oxygen content. They need clean water. They come from, you know, pretty nice streams where there's good oxygen content and things are clean. As long as they have that, they do pretty darn good. Yeah, I'm glad you have them, Mike. They're, they're awesome. One day I'd love to go collecting and get some of those, some rainbow shiners, some, some different darters. Oh, there's a lot of, yeah, I'd love to, you don't have to go far to have a cool collecting experience. The secret history living in your aquarium. Have you had issues with the yellow Denisonue turning muddled? Aquatic Arts was saying that some adults lose color and lost eyeballs at a bizarre rate. Have you seen that? Yes and yes, kind of. This fish right here, all the fish in here except for one, the, this guy, the guy with the little pug nose face. He's the only one that was a normally colored denison barb when I got him. All the rest were gold. As you can see, several of them have turned a dark brown color. So, um, I mentioned that in a video of a few weeks ago or something when I first noticed it. Um, I didn't know that till now though because I had never kept them long enough to grow them out. I had always sold them while they were still young, so I'd never seen it before. But yes, a percentage of them do I mean they're still different I can tell the difference um, so they aren't like reverting completely back but some of them do get a lot of brown on them and do get modeled for sure as far as the eye issue goes there's a percentage of them that come in and I don't think they're losing their eyes I don't think that's correct but somehow the eyes just aren't functioning correctly and like they're deformed or just don't function correctly. So there is a small percentage um, in each order I've gotten where I just don't sell those. Yeah. But, you know, they don't turn model color till they get big in adult size. So you don't know which ones are going to do that. Kind of like goldfish, right? When they change their colors. T Shot, do you have any plans on getting more black rams? The ones I got from you is doing great. Were those imported? Thanks. Yes, I, I did import those, um, but they weren't like freshly imported. <laughs> so the trick with those and geez, the trick in general is just <clears throat> TLC, import them, take care of them, get them hardy before you sell them. If everybody did that, man, there'd be a, a lot of people that were still keeping fish that ended up quitting after all their fish died. So, yep, they were imported and all that. Just, uh, you know, they were just treated right before they were sold. I don't have any plans to get more in. 
basically in my flow through system it is difficult to have a fish that has specialized requirements so I keep rams at 84 to 86 degrees and it's hard to do that in a flow through system so I probably won't get Ramirez eye is that how you say it I think so um, in the near future yeah okay oh man we're at 818 so we've got 12 more minutes we can do it let's see here chat jumped so I'm scrolling here what to do All right, the next one I can see is, let's see here, Jerry Serple Morris. Hey, good to see you, man. I hope you're doing well. Do you know if dwarf neon rainbows fry are reddish or slightly orange? I found a new, a few faintly red fry among my platinum rice fish fry. And the only thing I could think is that they would be the rainbows. Uh, no, in my experience, those babies are like little slivers of glass almost. Um, Unless you fed them a reddish colored baby brine shrimp and their their bellies turned reddish or they're eating something reddish, <clears throat> uh, that can happen. But besides that, no, uh, rainbow fish fry are generally like colorless almost. Maybe a little black on them, but pretty much little slivers of glass there. They're hard to see. So my guess is it's something that the rice fish are throwing off. Like, a, like there's something in their genes that... They're, when they breed, you, you get more than one kind of fry would be my guess. One color of fry. I don't know. I'm curious to see what they raise up to be. <clears throat> Orange cones. How much does anyone want to bet he would say once the warehouse is up and running? Too late. He did. Yeah, I know. I know. The warehouse is going to solve all the world's problems. <laughs> B start. Four gallon tank. What should I put in it? No heater. Goes down to the 60s. Tried cherry shrimp and they didn't make it. Hmm. I, I still think cherry shrimp could be a good option. In my experience with cherry shrimp in every Neocaridina or Caridina species I've tried is when I get them, either the batch does well and they all do great, or the batch does bad and they all do bad. It, it seems to be a supply issue. So my suggestion would be if you want to try them again, um, if you have a local pet store that has some and you can buy some that they've had for several weeks that would probably then you know the batch was good right they, they would be having troubles by then if they weren't good so that would be something to try um, but if you want to try fish four gallons so what is small doesn't need a lot of swimming space and uh, can go in a four gallon tank I mean, I honestly think that, I don't know how this tank is configured, but say it's like a standard five and a half gallon tank, but a little smaller. I honestly think that some of the, like like white clouds, a small group of white clouds would probably be okay in that. And they wouldn't mind that temperature at all. There are some killifish that can go down to those temperatures um, and are small. Does Leptolucania omata, hang on real quick. Lep so Lucania omata. This is a small killifish. Um, let me show it to you. <clears throat> kind of pretty thing. This is a native fish of the United States, but it looks like one of the Poropanchak species. It looks like a little lamp eye killy, right? But pretty little fish. Um, doesn't need too much space. Is native. So I'm wondering. <clears throat> Let me look here. It's found only in the southeastern United States. I, I would figure it could go down to the 60s without any problem. I'm trying to see its actual range. I mean, even Florida gets down to the 60s in the winter at times. Just to three centimeters. That's what I would look into. I, I, I don't want to take all day, and I, I'm not seeing it right away where their exact range is, but you can... See where their range is, see the temperatures, you know, look up the temperatures for where they're at natively. And I bet that they would be an okay one to try. Um, there are some suppliers every now and then that sell them. You might try Saks Aquaculture. You might try Jonas Aquarium. Um, you might try Chris Butcher. 
those those sources would give you a start at least. <clears throat> oh man, sorry, I got to do it again. But I really think beast heart shrimp would be a, an ideal thing, and just because the first batch didn't work doesn't mean the next one won't. Rachel Irwin, I've been losing my... Okay, I already got that one. Jaden Basurdo, any tips on raising rainbow fish? Yes, patience. Um, the trick with raising any fish, pretty much, is how do you get them enough food that they can eat all day long without polluting the water? So you're feeding them a lot and you're feeding them frequently. How do you do that and not pollute the water? So I do have a video, I believe, on raising uh, Melanotania rubra vitata, which is the red laser rainbow fish. So if you look up, um, I think that's the one. If you do a search on my channel, uh, I've got a video where I detail it. But basically, pick the eggs, put them in a little plastic shoe box with about an inch of water. Um, I change the water a couple times a day, even as eggs, just to keep them clean. I add a little hydrogen peroxide when they're eggs to keep them clean. Once they hatch, stop the hydrogen peroxide right before they hatch. And I just change the water frequently. Um, once they hatch, they're ready to eat. At least on rainbow fish, they don't have like that little, I'm a yolk sack with a little tail sticking out of it, period. They hatch, they're ready to eat right away. And so as soon as they hatch, start feeding them. Um, change the water frequently. That's kind of my secret. It's not a secret, but that's what's helped me. Three, four times a day is not too often. Change the water in there, like 100% of the water if you can. Like pour out as much as you can without pouring out the little baby rainbows. Then fill it with clean, aged, gassed off tap water that's been dechlorinated or treated as necessary for your area. Um, and do that until they're kind of getting big enough. You need to move them, then maybe a small aquarium with a little sponge filter and work them up the chain. But Keep food in front of them, keep the water clean. That's the mystery. However you figure out how to do that. Um, and really small foods for rainbows. They're tiny, tiny, tiny. At least the Melanotania and Chilitharina and Glossolepis and stuff. The Pseudomugils, which, you know, technically are in a rainbow, but close enough, right? They have bigger babies sometimes. <clears throat> T-Shot, throwing down five bucks and saying, I'm really enjoying the Building Dance Fish series. Um, very cool. Seeing all the behind the scenes. Congrats on all your success. Well deserved, sir. Well, thank you. I'm glad you like it. I think it's going to get more interesting as more employees join us and as we actually start physically building the warehouse. Um, next week, 300 and oof, some, a lot of tanks, <laughs> more than a semi truck load of tanks are going to arrive. So that should be cool. Um, of course, that'll be in the next video, not the one coming out on Sunday. Um, so cool stuff is going to happen. The contractor told me, and I hesitate to say this because who knows if this is real, but told me that they'll be breaking ground, you know, around June 15th. So that'll be cool once that starts happening. So I think it'll get better with time, but you know, right now it's a lot of me telling you what's going on. <laughs> I can't wait till it grows a bit, but I'm glad you're enjoying it. Killers Aquatics and Reptiles throwing down 90 and 99. I could not say that. 9.99. $9.99. $10 minus a penny. <laughs> and that is probably my cue. Thanks, Bob. And thanks, T Shot. To do the giveaway. Yes, it is. We are at 826. So let's do this giveaway here. How many people we got? We got 251. That is not bad for this little channel that could. Thanks for being here, everybody. If you'd like to win some red lizard catfish, 180 people are entered to do that. And the winner is Pose, Disabled Fish Keeper. Hey, or Keeper of Fish, sorry. Pose, Disabled Keeper of Fish, you have won. You have two minutes to leave a comment and chat and just say, hey, I'm here, or yay, or whatever, because you do have to be present to win. And once you do that, we'll go into how to claim your winnings. Pretty easy, just email me. Nathaniel Blakely, while we're waiting on pose, what is a good pleco to breed in a 100 gallon pond? Oh, you know, I here I would honestly do albino bushy nose plecos. I just think almost any other pleco, once you put them in the pond, you won't see them again. So 
how do you check on them? How do you know what's going on, right? You, you, can't, you can't find them. They're designed not to be seen. I mean, you could do like King Tiger Plecos would probably show up because they're white and black striped and stuff like that. But I think the albino bushy nose is what I would try. I could probably find them easier. Um, they're pretty hardy. They can take a wide variety of temperatures. And if everything went south, I wouldn't be out like, you know, five grand or whatever it costs for a nice group of plecos of the really fancy plecos. So I, I think that's what I would go with. Polo says, I am here. Woo, how awesome. Awesome. Well, congratulations on winning. If you would please send me an email, dan at dansfish.com is my email address. I need your first name, your last name, and your mailing address, and I will send those fish out. Oh, we're releasing all the new fish for sale on Friday, so stuff could get real crazy. Um, probably Tuesday of next week. It could be Thursday, um, which means they would arrive to you either on Wednesday or Friday. But please be a little patient with me. Um, sometimes when we, we release new fish, um, so all the new fish that came in will be released for sale this Friday morning. Uh, sometimes it's hard to keep up. So Pose, if you just be patient, let me play that by ear and keep in touch with you. Um, I'll send them as soon as I'm able. But thanks for uh, being here and I'm glad that, uh... <laughs> yeah, I'm glad that you won. That's awesome. The Fishy Mailman, don't forget the Tanganyikan Lamp Eye Lamprichthys Tanganyikanus. Yep, one of my absolute favorite fish of all time. Absolutely. That is one I would love to bring in. Well, with that, we are out of time, folks. One more. No, no, we're out of time. I will say, though, Punchy Paints is going next. So, if you want to head on over and join her, I believe she'll be going um, probably in about half an hour is, is normal, right? Right, Pam? Is that when you're going? But if you want more fish talk, more, more geeking out on fish and some art. Check out Punchy Paints live stream next. And thanks, Punchy Paints, for being such a great moderator. I appreciate it. Thanks to all my mods. Thanks for being here and doing what you do. Thanks to everyone that threw money at us. It's always wonderful when money just falls from the sky. So thank you. Um, everyone that left a chat and a comment and a question and kept this lively. I appreciate the participation and being here. Yeah and just making this a fun place to hang out. So thanks, everybody. Hail the Lurker Nation. I'm with you. I lurk all the time and lots of things. And if you can't be here live because you're busy, I understand. And I hope one day you can be. But until then, you know, that's what replays are for. <laughs> anyway, we'll be back next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Until then, I hope everyone has a good one. Bye-bye. Um,